Good evening, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and we're very pleased to welcome you to our program, Fiber, the Coming Tech Revolution and Why America Might Miss It. And we're very pleased to welcome author Susan Crawford, who's in conversation with Peter Rubin, who's a senior editor at Wired Magazine. We'd also like to thank our co-sponsors for the event tonight, the Electronic Frontier Foundation of San Francisco, and also our Harvard alumni group who's here also in the city. Uh, we thank you for your collaboration. And also we welcome subscribers and readers of Wired Magazine. Also I'd like to point out that there's information about EFF at the door, so please uh, take information on the Electronic Frontier Foundation before you leave. Before we begin, how many new, are new to the Mechanics Institute? Who's never been here before? Wow, wonderful, welcome. I'd like to invite you to come back on a Wednesday at noon and take the free tour of our incredible institute. The librarians will take you through our vast general interest library, which is on the second and third floors, show you the International Chess Club, which is right down the hallway, and give you a little background in history uh, Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854, so we've had a long life here in the city. Um, also, we have ongoing author events, such as this one, our Cinema Lit Film Series on Friday night. Uh, the Chess Club has ongoing chess tournaments and classes, and the library has a vast array of book clubs, as well as Proust Group and Writers Groups. So we hope that you'll take the tour, join us, become part of um, our ever-growing cultural family here at 57 Post Street in San Francisco. Also, this program is part of an ongoing series called Tech and the City, which we will be rolling out this spring and summer. And tonight we will focus on who will control and who will benefit from the next wave of technology, that of fiber optics. And we have two experts to engage us in this important conversation. Susan P. Crawford is the John A. Riley Clinical Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. She served as President Barack Obama's Special Assistant for Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy and is a columnist with Wired. She is a former board member of ICANN and the founder of One Web Day and also a legal scholar. And her research focuses on telecommunications and information law. And Peter Rubin oversees Wire's cultural coverage in the magazine and online. In 2014, his cover story on Oculus introduced readers to the rebirth of virtual reality. And he has also written frequently about the evolution of VR and its many applications. Prior to arriving at Wired in 2011, he was the feature writer and edit editor for more than a decade, penning over many stories for GQ, L, Details, Good, and other publications. So please welcome Susan Crawford and Peter Rubin. By way of checking if my mic is working, two details about Susan that were not mentioned uh, by Laura. One is she is an accomplished, accomplished violist, and the other is that her birthday is a day after mine, and both are next week. So happy early birthday oh, to happy Susan, birthday to and happy birthday to you, Pisces Power. Um, if you have not yet read Susan's book Fiber, uh, I cannot urge you strongly enough to do so. Hopefully, after we're done talking. Um, <laughs> Uh, it is informative and entertaining in all the ways you hope it will be. It is enlightening and it is absolutely infuriating in just the right way, meaning I left this book uh, absolutely overwhelmed and a little bit hopeless, so I'm hoping you can help chart a course out of this for us. Uh, now, Excuse I want to begin. Um, could you turn your microphone on? Is Susan. it not on? Oh. Susan? I'll try that again. It is on, and it is not muted. Let's see. Maybe I'm not talking loudly enough? I think it's Susan's microphone. We're going to pause for a second. I'll just leave it there in case. Mine, mine is on as well. Take 
But can I just say, Peter Rubin wrote a great book <laughs> called Future Presence about VR. And we have so many themes in common, we're just burbling at each other. He really cares about eye contact and the possibility of human connection in virtual reality. And I really care about human presence <laughs> and its possibility over fiber optics. So we're, it is, it suffuses me with well-being to get a chance to be with Peter and talk about this book. Well, you just took away like half my question, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, it wasn't intentional. Uh, it's just for fun, Peter. <laughs> it's all for fun. Uh, we will get to that. We will get to the okay. importance of presence and, and the many things that the, the, for, the affordances that, that Fiber mm -hmm. uh, grants. But I want to start with a very well-known uh, and now infamous remark by Senator Ted Stevens in 2006 when he called the internet a series of tubes. And we laughed roundly at this, but come to find out, not that inaccurate. He was unjustly maligned, I'd say, because in fact, not the internet, but internet access is a series of tubes. And it, there's, it's like the knee bones connected to the thigh bone. There are fiber networks in existence running between all major cities in the United States and between this country and, and submarine cables and other continents. But the very last part of this network, uh, people call it the last mile, the bit between, let's say, a neighborhood and your home, is the toughest part, sort of the gatekeeping part for telecommunications policy. And the fact is, in the United States, very little of that last mile is made up of fiber optic material. By contrast, China plans to have 80% of its homes wired to fiber in the very near future. And there's already 100% adoption, basically, in Singapore, Japan, South Korea, Sweden, other places. The book focuses on uh, the sort of breakdown in the series of tubes once it gets close to our houses and why that happened, why we got in this strange position where we seem to be Rome <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> communications infrastructure and what we might do about it. And it tries to be as optimistic as possible. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to start, if you could kind of break down for us the, the difference between fiber and any other communications cabling as we know it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had, we have widely available broadband internet at speeds that we've been told are screamingly fast. Right. Um, we no longer hear that little <laughs> from our modems. Right. Uh, <laughs> we're on DSL, right. we're on cable. Yeah. and, and isn't Wi-Fi fast enough anyway? So uh, if you could, I guess, quantify for us kind of how far past those technologies, those modalities, Fiber gets us and, and why it poses such a kind of transformative promise. Terrific. And we should all talk to my dry cleaner in New York City who has read the book and is so excited about fiber. He can't believe it. He said, this stuff is amazing. He's been having battles with Verizon that sells him DSL access. So. And uh, it broke down last summer. He had to roll all his clothes down Sixth Avenue in order to log them in a computer in another store. So he's really furious about communications access in New York City, Greenwich Village, inadequate yeah. connectivity. Um, so this is a tale of three wires. You don't have to know very much technically to understand the story. Our phone network, which was the envy of the world when it was introduced, is made up of twisted copper pairs uh, whose information capacity is limited when it comes to uh, uh, what we call broadband today, high, high capacity data, and is also subject to a lot of interference. Water, other wires, your baby monitor, your uh, microwave can all get in the way of uh, DSL access over copper wires. Cable companies, uh, and in America, most metro areas have a local cable monopoly selling high speed internet access. Um, uh, it's like, it really is like a fairy tale. Their wires, hybrid fiber coaxial, have greater bandwidth potential, can carry more data than copper, but the, their system was architected to vastly prefer downloading, passive sort of consumption of entertainment over uploading, and the network connections are shared at the, at the neighborhood level. So often when you're trying to do something online, all your neighbors are doing it too, and you'll notice that your uh, connection is more cramped than it could be. Fiber. I went to Corning to watch it being made, and in chapter two, you'll see me trying to be John McPhee of fiber. I describe <laughs> every step of how, how this happens, and it's, it's amazing. It's completely synthetically created glass. Starts with 
soot, sort of being uh, layered down, thousands and thousands of layers of differently constituted soot. Um, and they have engineered it so precisely to the micron, every element of this manufacturing process, that the resulting glass is so pure that light sent through that glass from a radar pulsing, a laser, sorry, pulsing light, um, goes without encouragement or amplification for dozens of kilometers, just a very long way. And that doesn't happen with these other mediums. And the other amazing thing about fiber is that as far as we know, once the glass is in the ground, its bandwidth potential, the amount of data it could carry, is essentially unlimited. So all the phone calls of the world today could simultaneously be carried on a single hair-thin strand of fiber optic. But our problem is distribution, because we are geographically located in different places. We have to get that very high capacity connection to homes and businesses in order to ensure that that very high headroom or data availability of fiber is, is there for all of us. Other countries have done this, and the United States hasn't. Uh, we've ended up with a series of cable monopolies, basically, in most parts of America, urban areas. Rural areas, by and large, struggling, often with satellite access or terrible um, copper wire connections. Our, our former phone companies, at and Verizon, have mostly backed off and become wireless companies where there's greater profit. None of this is evil or malign and nefarious in any way. It's just that unrestrained, very expensive infrastructure like this will become a natural monopoly. Companies will consolidate, control entire markets, and avoid competition where possible. And that's happened in the United States because we have no oversight. And at this point, very little competition. So even the great tech city of San Francisco, calls drop all the time. There isn't a great communications infrastructure here. And um, why is that is the puzzle that I work through in the book and try to explain it in the most humorous and authoritative and approachable way I possibly can. Uh, and, and you do succeed. Oh, thank you. Um, so, so how did we, what is the state of last mile fiber mm -hmm. in the U.S.? Uh, and, and how did it get to this point? As far as we can tell, about 13% of American households have access to fiber connections. It may be very expensive. Uh, Verizon's product, for example, is... Um, three times the price of what you might pay in Seoul or, or Tokyo for a connection that's a tenth as information heavy. Um, and the Fios, the Verizon product, is only available in a few leafy suburbs and isolated outposts. They stopped extending Fios in 2010. Um, again, not for nefarious reasons, but because the shareholders of Verizon, as a private company, didn't want to see the company uh, devoting so much energy and capital to fiber and were hoping that wireless would be the direction. They chose wireless instead of going on into fiber. So about 13%, and then that's in contrast to um, this 100% adoption in Asian countries and the Nordics and this huge push by China. This has become a real talking point for me with this book because sometimes it gets people's attention. It's not just the uh, sovereign country of China, but also the Belt Road Initiative, mm -hmm. which will touch 65% of the world's population and affect 40% 40 of the world's GDP. All of that will be associated with Chinese fiber and advanced wireless services. And it's unclear to me anyway whether American companies will be able to enter those markets because those will be perfectly engineered and controlled to favor uh, China. That means the future happens there and not in America. Now, what's been happening there is those, the success stories of Sweden and yeah. South Korea yeah. uh, and Japan, these are almost nationalized efforts. These take years and billions and billions of dollars. And here, the, much of the book concentrates on this group of small cities and sometimes yeah. not even cities, yeah. bands of towns. Uh, that with varying levels of success have kind of taken it upon themselves municipally to create this sort of connectivity. Um, you know, so what allows a city like Chattanooga, which features mm -hmm. prominently, to succeed 
and a city like Greensboro, North Carolina, to seem like it's not ever going to get there? Thanks for that question. There are 800 places in the United States, both uh, small cities, medium-sized cities, and cooperatives that have taken their destinies into their own hands and are offering what amounts to a public option, uh, sometimes in the form of a wholesale um, blank fiber grid, not, not having the government itself offering services, but making it possible for lots of retail competition to lease access to that fiber strand and make available competing services. Um, and it was a great privilege for me to roam across the country meeting people who had been involved in those networks. Some of this happened decades ago also. This is not a recent development, but it's, it's gaining steam right now. Uh, the, the differentiator seems to be a sense that we're all in this together. In Chattanooga, they had a long history of uh, the TVA nearby, and uh, they ran their own electrical utility. And um, they wanted to make sure that everybody had access to fiber, so the city made encourage the electrical util utility to float a bond to uh, raise money to uh, put in fiber to households. Now it's expensive and there are a lot of people in Ch Chattanooga who can't afford it. So it's not a huge shining success story from my standpoint, but it points at what's possible. That the uh, utility there in Chattanooga is a, doesn't want to get the incumbents, chiefly AT&T and Comcast, too angry at them, so they haven't lowered their prices um, to make it uh, affordable, frankly, by the poorer people in Chattanooga. And there are other places where they have taken that step to make it cheap. But it's, it's a sense of uh, civic fabric. In Chattanooga, they have something they call the Chattanooga Way. They, everybody is supposed to lower their ego just a bit and work together. The civic leaders, business leaders, private foundations play a very important role in convening, c encouraging everybody to work together, and citizen activists are part of this too. And just for the last 20 years, Chattanooga has been raising itself up out of the dirt. They were the dirtiest city in America in the 70s, and they planned and planned and planned and done a lot, and fiber is just of a piece with that. Greensboro is sinking into um, decorous irrelevance, I'd say, in contrast to the research triangle everybody's heard of. Greensboro is part of the triad, Winston-Salem and, um, and Greensboro, part of it. And East Greensboro, traditionally African-American neighborhood, was very slow to get electricity and today has terribly inadequate internet access. And the city has no plan to do anything about that. And they're not thinking of it, we're all in this together. This is a utility, not a luxury. That's not the way they plan, so that's why. So you know this is this is something that is you know we've been hearing about the the digital divide and living with the repercussions of the digital mm -hmm. divide since the first you know yeah. fifty six baud modems went into some homes and not others yeah. and now we it seems as though this speed chasm is arguably more damaging than even access or no access because of this move into ever more intensive uses of data. So where are we kind of now with what that data is being used for and, and this kind of steady march towards 5G speeds? Yeah. And you know, this isn't, and maybe even 6G speeds, depending on if you look at President's tweets today. Yeah, this morning, Pre President Trump and I are having a sort of rare mind meld this morning about the importance of advanced wireless. What he hasn't seemed to pick up on is that that's going to require fiber, too. You can't have advanced wireless without a, a lot of fiber in the ground. And so that seems to be a, a, a pretty widespread misconception, is yeah. that as our phones are marching towards 5G connectivity yeah. and this in, in, incredible speeds, that we don't need fiber. And saying that is like saying, oh, we've got airplanes. We don't need airports because your wireless communications have to go somewhere. They have to land on a wire in order to get to the rest of the internet. And very high capacity 5G communications are very quivering very quickly, very high frequency, and that's why they can carry so much information, which is great. But it also means they get kind of shy when they get either to a bag of water like us, a human, or a window or a wall, and they don't penetrate there, and they don't go very long distances before falling falling off almost entirely. So there has to be fiber really deep into all American neighborhoods in order for these advanced wireless systems to work. Um, but people don't seem to be talking about that enough, so we're going to make sure they do. 
uh, and we also need to make sure not to replicate the monopoly in wired service that we have right now in most American cities in the wireless world. It is so expensive to install the series of small cells that'll be needed for 5G. Uh, because those pieces of spectrum get nervous, they have to put the cells very close together, and that's expensive, and they all have to be fed with fiber, that unless some intervention happens by the government, these companies will inevitably consolidate and divide markets and say, you take Sacramento, I'll take San Diego, because uh, that just makes sense. The cable industry did that in 1997. They called it the summer of love. And they swapped their systems and made sure that the whole thing was rational, that wherever they were, they would never step on each other's toes. And that's why if you live in a Time Warner or Charter City, Comcast isn't there. You may have wondered why that is, because they just don't compete. So anyway, we, uh, 5G is ahead, but it depends on this first step, which is getting a great communications infrastructure reaching everyone, and not just for uh, the thrill of speed, but because the new industries, the new jobs, um, everything we want to do with healthcare policy, everything uh, to make uh, great education available to every American, all of that depends on having a terrific communications infrastructure reaching everybody at a very reasonable price. And right now we have no plan to get there. Yeah, education and, and healthcare and industry are all, you know, this isn't, I have Netflix, everything is fine. Right. These are kind of, we are moving into an age where our kind of need for this immediate transmission of gigabytes, if not terabytes of data Right. Are you know so so if you could outline a little bit about some of these kind of applications and how different cities are using it, what we're seeing in, mm -hmm. in telemedicine and education. Well, some of the most moving examples of use of fiber and advanced wireless are in healthcare. We waste thirty percent of the money we spend on healthcare. We we waste more money on healthcare than many countries spend, and a lot of our and we pay more for healthcare than in most other developed nations and get less for it. And a lot of this happens in wasted hospitalization visits and, and time uh, and sort of the inefficiency of all of that. Um, imagine this. Imagine you're a somewhat lonely kid in a rural area in America. With fiber, you could have eye contact and empathetic relationship with a therapist who could really help you out and understand you and make you feel seen. This is one of our great points of contact here. Um, and offer you uh, hope for your future. And this is happening in some rural areas. Maine cares about a lot about this, and so does Wisconsin. Um, but it should be more widely available, that uh, especially for kids who are often more comfortable with screens than <coughs> seeing humans sometimes. Uh, the ability to be cared for at a distance requires a very high capacity network. This sort of ambient awareness of other humans around you is something uh, people in Sweden are, are testing with older people. Uh, most of us want to stay at home and don't want to have to leave our homes in order to go to some institution, but it would be great if we could be checked on in a really human way, not just by beeping and looking at your retina scan, but actually someone feeling present with you in the room. That's possible with fiber, not possible with our current communications networks. And again, very human, saves a lot of money, and uh, only, and, and, is, and requires enormous amounts of data. And it, the lovely thing about fiber is that where it's in place, we could think of our old networks as giving us sort of a two inch wide stream of water, and fiber is 15 miles. It's just, it really is, as if the pixels fall away and there's just a pane of glass between you and the rest of the world. And that's all humans want, really. So let's, let's bring it a little closer to, if not your home, our yeah. home. Yeah. Uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. We, there is a fiber provider, uh, Sonic. Yay, Sonic, local company, but they're not serving everybody. So, yeah. so where does San Francisco fit in the kind of the, the, you know, we have all these small cities, we have towns that are really pushing for this. Mm -hmm. Where does San Francisco fit? Is there, are they at the vanguard of larger cities? And if so, how evolved are they? How far along are they in well, this? Well, they almost effort? took a huge lead just a couple of years ago. Um, mayor Ed Lee and then Supervisor Farrell, who was the interim mayor after Mayor Lee's passing, 
were working very hard on uh, closing the digital divide and serving everybody in San Francisco with a dark fiber network touching every home and business. And uh, after Mayor Lee died, Farrell had just about six months to really work on this plan and try to get it off the ground. And apparently, internal polling carried out uh, of San Franciscans by AT&T, I believe, revealed that two thirds, <laughs> two thirds of people in San Francisco wanted this to happen, that they felt it would be a worthwhile thing to do. So there was a lot of support for it, but I think the Farrell's administration felt they didn't have quite enough momentum to get it over the finish line, and that for the new mayor it hasn't been a priority, as I understand it. Some great city in America is gonna get this straight, and I really hoped that it was gonna be San Francisco that would do it first. Um, again, providing a wholesale network, not itself selling services, because when a city is itself selling services, you have to think about surveillance and censorship and other risks of being the communication provider. But it's just infrastructure. It's a public work. It's like a bridge, a street grid. And our major American cities should be doing this so, to spur the creation of a very competitive retail market for internet access. So how does a, something that's seen as a luxury good become a utility? I mean, you look well, at other countries where this has happened, and you look 100 years ago at this happening here. Right. For some telling examples. Well, and thank you for uh, telling everybody. Look, we went through exactly the same story with electricity in America. And it is stunning sometimes how close the parallels are. That electricity, when electricity was young and people were stunned by it, men fell to their knees seeing electricity for the first time in the form of street lamps, um, it was purely privately operated and only made available to first uh, cities and streetcars and then gradually large businesses and then gradually very rich homes and then really, really gradually poor people and then it really didn't happen without encouragement. Like 90% of farmers in the 30s did not have electricity. And there were, it was just a cartel controlling electricity, purely private offering, a luxury, until um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt got in there and he had a lot of experience with the private power industry. He had noticed that the private power industry uh, dealing in the St. Lawrence in, in New York State uh, was charging like 3x what their Canadian publicly controlled counterparts were over the border. And when he went to um, Georgia to have his polio treated in Warm Springs, he noticed that people in Georgia were paying three or four times what he was paying in his Hudson Valley estate. And that really bothered him. So he had sort of a visceral feeling about the power industry. And he took on the electrical industry. Um, and the, in the 1932 election, public power was the domestic policy issue, which seems amazing to us today. Because of course it's a utility. Who would ever think it's a luxury? Um, right now, in the internet access story, we're at sort of at the beginning. We're just beginning to realize that, in fact, it's a necessity for life. We've got these cartels operating it, and uh, the market is not providing the sort of service that our great nation deserves. And we, we gotta do something about it. There's a quote from Jerry Garcia in the book. So, uh, something's gotta be done, and it's just absolutely pathetic that it has to be us. Uh, and it is pathetic that it has to be these cities that are working on this um, to take the step. And that's what happened with electrification to a bunch of uh, publicly owned cooperatives and city electrical utilities made the move towards making sure that power was cheap and plentiful even before FDR got involved and made sure the, the, the entire industry was overseen and there was real government intervention in it. So, so because this is happening right. kind of at that third stage of yeah. the infrastructure, right? There's the backbone, there's the, yeah. the, uh, the back hall, yeah. and then there's the last mile. Does, is, is it even worth it to try to make this a federal issue? If all we need is a new New Deal yeah. for fiber, like, is, is there even a hope of that becoming a national priority rather yeah. than something that forward-thinking mayors spearhead? It inevitably is gonna, in the end, it has to be a national priority. Because I've talked to you a lot about the last mile. Turns out that middle mile is also cartelized and very heavily concentrated. And today, the backbone market is also getting more and more concentrated. And Google and Facebook operate their own backbones to, to get around the whole thing. So in fact, we have, we have to have a real rethink of our communications infrastructure 
um, just to ensure that there is, a, there is a wholesale offering that is inexpensive and available to everybody. Given, it's a big step. So uh, we've seen what happens when, the, when net neutrality comes back around for yeah. discussion. We've seen what side of this agit pie presumably falls on. How do you change, how, how do you enable this, how do you facilitate this uh, becoming something that isn't just a priority but something that is enacted in some meaningful way? Well, first you write a book. That's what I tried to do. And it all starts with that. It all starts with that. But also, um, there are five companies that are doing very well because of the status quo. And they're Comcast, Charter, AT&T, Verizon, and CenturyLink. There are a lot of other American businesses and a lot of other Americans who have noticed this but don't quite understand it. And if they could just get a bit of a clue about how awful this is and how far behind we are from other nations and uh, and the fact that we're all paying rent to a few companies, that seems kind of unnecessary. Um, it could become the kind of election issue that electricity was back in the 30s, because it's just as essential, especially for young people. This just seems amazing. How could it be that we have no choices and it's so expensive and X, Y, and Z? Um, and it's like not being able to breathe or not having clean water. One fiber guy who works in Kuala Lumpur actually said to me, that he feels that what we're up to in America is like child abuse, that we're treating our, our youngsters so badly by not allowing them to have adequate infrastructure in their lives, to do their homework, to just keep up with the rest of the world. You know, speaking of these kind of five companies that are doing really well with the yeah. status quo, you do kind of get a, a little bit into the, into the gamesmanship and the dirty tricks that- Shenanigans. Uh, shenanigans that are being enacted. <laughs> either you know, at the municipal level or even the federal level, the, mm -hmm. the American Legislative Exchange Council uh, has actively tried to sideline cities right. from, from doing this. And so I, I'd like to, just because I enjoy the rage from hearing about this, I want, you know, if you, if you could detail a little bit about kind of those who are holding the cards or how they're trying to hold on to those cards. Well, let's put it this way. Um, AT&T, today's AT&T is the product of many, many, many mergers that uh, sort of glued Ma Bell back together again after you thought we broke them up in 1984. Throughout those mergers, they really didn't let go of anybody in their government affairs offices anywhere. And so effectively, they've got man on man, woman on woman uh, defense and control at the state level. They've been giving to charities across the country. They're just fully embedded in every congressional district. And the same for Comcast. So, uh, and here's another part of the story. The video revenues um, that Comcast and Charter and others make from selling us pay TV, 5% of that goes back to cities or states. So that gives a tremendous incentive to keep the system in place. Um, for local government, because they can use that money for good works, and it's hard to cut away from that. So uh, between the conflicts of interest and the intense lobbying pressure, and the fact that most officials are there for a short time, and this is a long-term planning problem, uh, leads to a certain amount of um, humans are capable of enormous self-deception, and everybody will say, oh, look, it's, it's basically OK. Let's just keep moving. And I, I think that is ceasing to be an acceptable answer when it comes to internet access. So, so uh, there's kind of one thing missing from this conversation so far, yeah. and, and you were kind enough to mention my book. Yes. And um, you know, in writing about virtual reality, which uh, is still a technology or an experience that a lot of people have not had, right. granting some sort of experiential portal in, into that is kind of crucial to writing that kind of a book. And, yes. and fiber is the same way. It is. Because you know, I think that I have high-speed internet, yeah. uh, and I do by the government's standards, certainly, mm -hmm. but what, you know, you opened the book in South Korea, in Pyeongchang, uh, yeah. during the Winter Olympics, and you visited a number of other countries where this is the norm. What is it actually, like, what is that difference? How palpable is it? The palpable difference is that you never think about it. Never think, it just recedes, because there's sort of unlimited capacity, and it's cheap wherever you are, whatever you want to do, when needed, as needed. If you wanted to upload a giant graphics file, if you wanted to edit a movie in your home and then send it to a colleague, you just do it. And here, we think all the time. We sort of uh, deploy a lot of brain power trying to find connectivity, waiting for things to happen, um, not quite sure if it's going to work, calls are dropping. So in the most sort of simple sense, 
It's just you forget about it. We, as we've forgotten about electricity, you don't, we're not thinking about what this room is rated for or how many appliances we can turn on. We just assume it's going to work. And that's what it's like in these other countries. There's, it's never a limit on anything. And what I worry about is that uh, we, the U.S. won't be the sandbox, sort of the playpen for the development of new businesses and industries that depend on this great capacity. Um, Paul Romer won a Nobel, Nobel Prize for talking about the necessity of basic investments that then give rise to new recipes for living. Um, and our R&D spending is hugely down, you know, sort of a quarter of what, what it was when I was a kid. And this idea of having a functioning commodity communications network is, just doesn't exist either. So why would we be the place of the future? Why? So, so you know, this, the idea that you never think about it is, yeah. is a charming one, but it doesn't feel like it is a use case that's so compelling that everybody here says we need that too. Ah. That we have what we want, or we've, we were talking about this earlier, the idea of symmetry, where your upload speeds are as fast as your download speeds, is something, and I work adjacent to the tech industry, is something that hadn't even occurred to me as a possibility, as naive <laughs> as that is. Um, and so what is that thing that isn't here yet that is right. going to make that need I think it really will happen in health or education, this idea of human presence. So right now, if you try to take a class at a distance, you're kind of a lurker or an eavesdropper. You're not really part of it. You're a second-class citizen. If you try to join a meeting, you're constantly saying, well, I'm on the phone, and it's just horrible, and everybody's worrying about that. What if you really felt you were at the meeting, and not necessarily through virtual reality, but just being you know, at the meeting um, through a, a series of, of screens and actual eye contact. When that happens on a regular basis for some people but not for others, I think that's when we get jealous. It's, it's human presence, I think, is the initial killer app for this. That idea of be, not just seeing everybody on a Skype screen or a right. Zoom screen, but actually being embodied. Yeah, or feeling, feeling that you're, that you're in the there. you're in space with yeah. another person. Yeah. yeah that's, and that's, that's an interesting one because it is something that is such the province of early adopters and it's being used in somewhat trivial capacities right right you have these social vr networks in which you are inside it and you the, the body of your avatar is the body that you inhabit mm -hmm. and your head and your hands move the way you really are and, and you are translated into this space but because it's being used in this kind of larky way mm -hmm. there's not this feeling that it is uh that it's a crucial Mm -hmm. wrinkle in our ability to collaborate, to work together, to learn from one another, exactly. to heal each other. Exactly. Um, and so there is a chicken egg thing going on. Mm -hmm. So they're hand in hand, but which one is going to push the other into the mainstream, I guess, is the question. Does VR and AR push the need for fiber to mm -hmm. people, or does fiber help tip these spatial technologies? Or just to be really wonky here, does Medicare start reimbursing for telemedicine in a way that m makes sense and does really lower costs. And it, it, insurance often drives weird changes in policy, and this could be a big one. Like, yes, we accept that this is a visit to a doctor if you have this kind of network and you're able to have this kind of screen and be in this sort of presence. That would make a big difference. That would drive a lot of change. What sort of regulatory approach are we going to need for this? At, well, at a, at a uh, level. bravery, I would <laughs> say. Uh, bravery and leadership. Um, it's just lowering the cost of capital for the installation of these last mile networks and holding them to a particular standard that they be at the least publicly governed, if not publicly owned, at the wholesale level again. So that, again, the market won't consolidate, divide up, and do all the other things that we know happen if you just leave the private sector to its own devices. So lots of, there are lots of tax incentives. The role of the Fed is interesting. The whole last chapter is like a mm -hmm. spray of policy ideas that would help uh, move this along. Yeah, there's a whole host of financing options that, you know, that you, all these cities and towns that you kind of spend time in throughout the book. Right. You mentioned dark fiber, which San Francisco has the opportunity yeah. to employ uh, in bonds or, or, or whatever it is. And is it going to be that kind of patchwork approach? To I think initially, for this? I think initially that's where it's all going to start, mm -hmm. and that's what happened with electricity too. Lots of patches, and then they form together gradually. How much is this going to be a plank 
in some candidates' platform? Well, the uh, current mayor of South Bend, in Indiana, whose last name I can't pronounce, but I admire him. Buttigieg? Thank Buttigieg? you. Buttigieg? One of the two. He really Sorry. understands this. He knows about it. And uh, I would love to see him get more of a national profile on it. I'd, none of the other candidates have expressed any interest so far in this Which issue. seems, maybe it's premature, but it seems like... It, it seems so Given obvious. that we're a year away from the first primary, I know. I know. there's a lot of time for this need to, to, or for more people to read the book. I think that's right. Well, I think Cory Booker is going to get it because Newark has done a lot mm. about fiber. They are now a fiber city. So that he may be somebody who gets the difference. But we only have a federal highway system because when he was a young lieutenant, um, Dwight Eisenhower, right after the First World War, joined a convoy of trucks and, and cars going across the United States just for fun. And it took them two months because the, the, they kept sinking into the mud. There were no good roads, particularly in the West. And he really felt that, and it irritated him. And so he said, well, we're going to have a federal highway system, it, you know, and uh, moderate Republican. That kind of person who has experienced the lack of Internet access or how expensive it is for people in the United States, we would need someone like that who would, uh, like Lincoln was a railroad lawyer. He really understood the railroads and cared about their role in American society. Uh, we don't have someone like that right now for Internet access. So I have to say, the story that you just told about yeah. Eisenhower and the convoy and how it led to the interstate system, that and FDR's power bill in Warm Springs yeah. are two stories that I took from this book and have already kind of passed off as my own knowledge. Absolutely, it's, they are yours like, now. <laughs> but, but you know, what I was saying to you earlier is that this really fills in uh, an incredible number of kind of contextual gaps mm -hmm. in the way that the grid grew in this country. Right, and, and it, it's a very basic point that we used to have the view that there was a line between public and private and the role of the public sector was to ensure that the private sector flourished and that all Americans flourished. That's the regulatory ideal. And these actors that we've just listed uh, moved on enormous programs of public works that made America what it is today. And yet, a student at Harvard a few months ago said to me, why do we even need government? Couldn't the private sector just do what government does except better? <sighs> and you know, and that he's not alone in that kind of sentiment. We've kind of forgotten what the role of government is. And so I, I want to be part of the vanguard that reminds us. And oh, by the way, those 800 places working on these, na these networks, most of them are in Republican areas. So this is a thoroughly bipartisan effort aimed at economic growth and social justice in areas across the country. Now, I know we're going to uh, open this up to questions in a couple of minutes, but, but I want to ask you one last thing yeah. uh, before the actual smart questions can begin. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that you, you worked on this book for five years. Yeah. Um, I got distracted. N n this was not about <laughs> to be a criticism. <laughs> not, a lot you of didn't have anything else going on. <laughs> I did, yeah. Um, teaching and viola. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but in the, when you started this book in 2014, yeah. I would imagine that you had one idea about the way this was going to go in this country. Mm. What changed between then and the publication of the book? How did your outlook change? Are you more or less hopeful or hopeless? It, it became more important to me to honor um, the majesty of these individual Americans in their communities who think so clearly about the future. It became so important to me to tell those stories with respect um, because uh, we don't hear about this. We, we hear about you know people in New York and Washington sloshing around and making terrible mistakes. And there's actually a lot of greatness in America. And I, I felt the need to capture that that I might, might not have felt in 2014. It seemed really important to tell the story. Wonderful. Susan, thank you so, so much thank for being you. here. I appreciate uh, that. I know we have a microphone thank that will you. be circulated, so uh, have at it. I'll, yeah. let you, I'll let you pick. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, we'll start right here I and work yes. our way around. Looks like he's anxious. Yeah. Hi, I'd like to thank you for writing this. I've been waiting for someone to articulate this, this, this issue. Um, my question, do you think there are any organizations that could carry the flag on this and go against the telecommunication executives and get the real information out there? Thank you for asking the question. There are a couple of organizations that are doing a very good job. There's something called Next Century Cities, again, bipartisan completely, which has almost 200, maybe 250 mayors 
all talking about advanced networks, sharing information. This is a very generous crowd. Um, and supporting them uh, and uh, lifting up their messages seems like a really great idea. Um, there's also a group called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance that publishes a site called muninetworks.org. It's a little homespun at the moment, but they are the source of data about these local efforts, and it's important to notice them and point to them at all, at all points. Carrying the flag is tough in America. Um, I do think the National League of Cities or the National Conference of Mayors eventually will take up this issue in a big way. I, uh, I don't know which one of them will do it, but mayors, as we've seen with climate change and other sort of fundamental issues, Mayors have the best interests of their citizens at heart and, and uh, want to make progress on this, but they need political cover. So, uh, so that's what I would suggest. Watching those two organizations and then supporting local leaders and then finding the federal candidate who really understands this. And making sure that everybody running for office, whether it's dog catcher or school board or mayor or, or you know, congressman, has to answer a question, what are you doing to ensure that everybody in our community has very uh, cheap, uh, persistent data connection. Did we have a few questions up front here? Sure. Have one here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I believe fiber is everywhere, wherever human beings are. That's what I think. You know. Can fiber network? Every fiber net uh, point has got a, a specific information which is fixed. That is location of that node or whatever mm -hmm. point you can say. Can network offer location as a service so that we don't need GPS? Because GPS is an old Stone Age system. Huh. We, why should we ask 12,000 miles up above the sky? It's here. Yeah. Why cannot a small beacon tell us, blue tooth beacon tell us what location we are in? Yeah. We don't need GPS. If you can provide this thing. Well, I, I wish I shared your faith in uh, the location of fiber, but to tell you the truth, most major American cities don't know what's under their streets. There was a guy named Hank who knew this decades ago, but he retired. And uh, it, it, is, it is weird how inaccurate the information is about where this stuff is. So I wouldn't want to rely on it for navigating our way through treacherous circumstances. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, we don't really know. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'd like to suggest that in addition to the last mile, it might be the last 50 feet. Mm -hmm. And why do I say that is, is that I'm the first sonic fiber household in North Berkeley. And I have a very fast computer, very fast Wi-Fi, whatnot. But the bottom line is it takes a whole nother level of education to use the fiber at any real level. Mm -hmm. and. I honestly don't think the use case has been made here. I know that there is one, but that's the draw to get the interest is, yeah. is the actual use. And I, I'm sorry to say that it hasn't been made tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could talk more about it because there is a case, but I can just, again, from my own, my own use of fiber for about the last eight months, and again, I'm not ignorant about the technology, mm -hmm. That last 50 feet is the real deal. Yeah, I hear you about the, about the use case. It's, um, it's a chicken and egg issue in that uh, I know that there are some things that are only possible using fiber. Like working collectively on a very large file is very difficult unless you've, both, you've all got a terrific data connection that most Americans don't have. And I know that this kind of presence application that I'm talking about is not possible at this point. Um, but until we have the sandbox for exploration, it's hard to get the incentives to develop the apps. That's what's going on. So no human has ever asked for less bandwidth at a higher price. Um, and we've always found ways to use it. What I'm worried about is that other countries are figuring out how to make that bandwidth available. And China is going to figure out what the applications are for the future. They are scrappier, if anything, than we are. So, but I, I take take your comment to heart. I really do. Question in the back. In the back. Well, I'm a resident of Coal Valley, and um, 
I remember about three or four years ago, it seemed, that um, two things were happening simultaneously. Uh, there was something going on at City Hall, Board of Supervisors. Yep. We're hearing um, the, something about putting fiber optics in yes. every neighborhood. Yep. And then uh, there was an issue about putting these ugly steel boxes on every block or two. Amazingly enough, the whole subject went away, followed by ugly steel boxes every few block, uh, blocks. How did this happen without, I think, anybody knowing about it? Some deal was made. You, were, you live in San Francisco. You must have been looking at this. Can you explain what happened? I think you're referring, are these AT&T U-verse boxes? Yes. Well, that's AT&T's requirement. They, they have what they call fiber, fiber to the node, which means that they take that fiber to some, that neighborhood ugly box, and then they run copper wire into people's homes and it doesn't have the kind of capacity we're talking about up here. That, whatever arrangement was made between AT&T and the city at that point, I, I don't know, uh, but I, I actually wasn't, I don't live in San Francisco and I wasn't involved in that. I just, so, sorry I can't be more helpful about that. We have a question here. Yeah. Yes, hi, uh, thank you and thank you for doing the book. I have to say it's the clearest, most cogent account I've read so far. Oh. Really well put together. Oh, thank so thank you. I appreciate you. that. Um, my question has to do with drivers. Um, I'm wondering if there's a lot of interest in business around the Internet of Things, so-called, mm -hmm. uh, connecting bunches of stuff to high-speed networks. Um, could business end up be, being a driver for greater distribution mm -hmm. of fiber? And, and if that does happen, in your opinion, is that more likely or less likely to drive regulation and public control? Excellent. Okay. so. If those things are cars, yes, because driverless cars may be the most of things of the Internet of Things we ever see, and they're going to require tsunamis of data in order to navigate their way around, and only with fiber is that going to be possible. Um, if American business wants to not be paying rent to these few carriers uh, you know, in the form of amplified prices, you would think they would demand a competitive marketplace for very high capacity connections throughout the country. That would make sense. For some reason, the business community has not been exercised about this. I think the CEOs are just too busy meeting their quarterly demands and you know, dealing with what they've got. I'm hoping that the book and the nationwide conversation about this raises the temperature for the rest of the American business community that isn't Comcast and Charter. But I think the cars is a use case that, that may very well uh, drive appetite for higher. Because you, sh you should know that for most Internet of Things applications, like the sensors for water and stuff like that, those can be very low bandwidth and don't necessarily require fiber in order to function. So, but cars do. A quest two questions here. Yeah. Um, you touched briefly on the number of lobbyists that are working for the incumbent players. Yeah. And um, I happen to be involved with a company that's trying to do stuff in this area. Yeah. And one of, the, one of the things that comes up is, you know, a lot of times the elected officials will say, well, we, we've signed some deal or we have some state law that gets in the way of that. Yeah. Um, I haven't read your book. Sorry about that. But um, I will. What, 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 sort of, what sort of thoughts do you have on how cities and states can get around the agreements that they made maybe in a very different era? when they didn't quite understand what they were maybe signing away. We well, have to hope those agreements expire because as a lawyer, I'm not going to suggest that the city go out and breach the agreements that it's made with other people. Um, but often they do expire. You know, uh, say your electric utilities franchise is about to expire. Well, maybe you should consider ensuring that that electric utility is also making blank dark fiber available throughout the city just as a condition of being there at the electric utility. So there may be moments when those contracts come up for bid where an informed city could really make the difference. But this is also kind of the root canal of policy. Uh, my hometown is Santa Monica, California, and there there was a chief technology officer, Jory Wolf, who went to every single public works meeting for 20 years, basically, <coughs> and he had a telecom master plan. And every time the street was open, he made sure that fiber was part of the story. And so that's why the city can now offer businesses in Santa Monica municipal fiber services. And they're extending that now to residences. That's, but that took sustained effort and paying attention. And it wasn't some 
you know, fireworks uh, contract renegotiation. It was just block and tackle, making sure that the city had the opportunity to put in fiber. So, yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk, it was really interesting. Um, my question is kind of related to this one, yeah. which is um, even though it's a hairline fiber, yeah. you gotta dig up streets and you have to put it in the ground. So once you go beyond fiber to the node or fiber to the curb and get to fiber to the premises, mm -hmm. part of it is trying to get neighborhoods to, to dig up their streets and actually lay, lay the fiber. Mm -hmm. So how much of this could be fixed uh. by greasing the wheels in a good way to, by, by the governments yeah. to help get that, that laid mm -hmm. um, from a public policy perspective. And I think, like, yeah. I believe it was Amy Klobuchar that had the, uh, a similar proposal where any time a road was being dug up, they'd lay the fiber down. But, yeah, like, exactly. but that's more like the rights of ways, how do you get it to the home? Yes. Um, so there have been great advances, by the way, in digging up the streets. There's something I describe in the book called micro-trenching, which does not involve going very deep, and it's a very narrow cut. And then the fiber just goes next to the curb structure, and you don't dig up the entire street, but just a pretty narrow segment. Um, but then there still have to be cabinets in the uh, private property area for the fiber to go to the home. What the city can do is say for all you know, developments henceforth, they shall be fitted with conduit, with lots of space in it. Some people call this dark air. We talk about dark fiber all the time, but dark air is also really important. Empty conduit that's available for any competing fiber provider to come into the basement, essentially, of any new building. Um, and that's, that's how places like Stockholm does this and Paris has this. They have requirements and building codes that there, there be that kind of conduit availability going into the basements of private areas. The problem is San Francisco has lots of older buildings. New York has the same issue. And so it almost has to be done on a building by building basis. Because the, the other thing, I haven't even talked to you about the other choke, choke points here. Landlords can be a big problem. So I live in a building in New York City that doesn't have Fios, although it's offered in the city because I think we have some kind of exclusive deal as a building with Spectrum. And that, you know, so there are lots of opportunities for little tiny vigs, little gives, little bribes. And uh, whatever, the city can fix a lot of this through ordinances, but it is a, it's a tough battle, got to say. Hope that helps. There, there is certainly a lot to be done. Yeah. Hey, Professor. I uh, read Captive Audience, read this book. I really recommend everyone to read it. And, oh, and one of the things, I have uh, two things I wanted to, to point out. One, one really... The facts that you bring out are incredible because I think when people learn about it, they're enraged. Uh, captive audience, the one fact that I remember was uh, it cost Comcast a fraction of a penny in dropping to do an hour of video. And then they're telling us like how much we should pay for them for that, that service and that's absurd. Uh, the, what I will, what would love your opinion on is the political debate about getting all Americans connected to fiber is connected to how much would that cost. Yeah. And I remember just there, I don't think there's a concrete number out there. Or, or if there is, I'd love to hear your thoughts because yeah. I tend to think the industry will say it's trillions of dollars, right? Like they'll say yeah. some number, it makes it impossible, which I, I don't think that's, that, that it's even rational. Um, but how do we get to that? Like how do we get to that point where we can actually say this is what it costs to get there and we will do it, you know, in terms of policy? Yeah, uh, Deloitte and a report that came out last year said something between 80 billion and 115 billion. Um, you know, Compared to what is the question, too? And there's a lot of capital sloshing around the United States, pension funds and other places there to look for safe vehicles to park it in. And infrastructure is a great investment. It pays back forever until the sun explodes, but just less than a media company would. And these, uh, so Comcast and Charter and Verizon are basically media companies at this point. Um, so I think there is, there is a great argument to make, be made that this is a good place to put capital, but it would take some government intervention, I think, to lower the cost of that capital by guaranteeing loans or you know, having the Fed get involved. I've got lots of ideas about this. Um, but the cost of not doing it is stupendous. And, so, and that's the way we saw the telephone system and electricity in the first place, that this is just basic stuff block and tackle stuff, and we should have it as a country. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, are any companies laying their own fiber besides hedge funds and ad networks? 
Any companies laying their own fiber? Companies, corporations. Oh, well, tech companies do a lot of the time. The data centers that, uh, to, so to get around the weaknesses in the American telecommunications network, the major tech players will have data centers very close to all of us so that content gets to us very quickly. Um, and so to do that, they have laid their own fiber across the country to make that possible. So again, we're sort of splitting this whole issue into what, if you can afford it, you build it for yourself, just the way that Amazon wants to have health insurance with Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan Chase, same idea. Let's avoid the broken healthcare market in America and just make something that works for us. And the same thing is happening in fiber for major corporations as well, if that's an answer. And yes, there are lots of, lots of entities that do build it for themselves. Question here? Yeah. Hi there. I haven't read the book, but I'm really excited to read it. Oh, okay, um, fine. And there's I'm, an independent bookstore here <clears throat> selling books. Perfect. I'll, I'll pick one up. Okay. Um, if you could write your name inside. Um, oh, of course. But uh, the question that I have for you, I've recently moved out from the East Coast where I was working on, on telecommunications policy issues. And I'm interested in your thoughts on the uh, continued viability of the Universal Service Fund contribution reform and what needs to happen <sighs> and whether the USF can be used to achieve some of the goals that you've set out in the yeah. book. Well, this question is like operatic. There are blood and guts spilling from the walls. Maybe you can't see it, but the Universal Service Fund is a rising percentage uh, tax, essentially, applied to your long distance phone bills. It's up to 18% now, I think. And that funds uh, telephone service and increasingly internet access service to very hard to reach expensive rural areas. Um, the problem is that a lot of us don't have uh, you know, long distance as, a, as the vehicle for funding that seems like a mismatch. Like, why are we doing it that way? Why aren't internet access connections levied in order to support, support that? So the whole system is a precarious set of uh, compromises that many telecom people just want to walk away from and hope it survives their retirement, essentially. Uh, it, it clearly needs to be reworked, and the Obama FCC took a big swing at reworking it. Um, uh, the problem is the subsidies tend to go to the same companies that are making money from the existing status quo. So what they've, the, if look at it from the company's perspective, they'll say, we want high returns for these uh, rich, densely populated areas, and we're going to leave the rest of it to the state. Uh, to fund us, you have to subsidize us to reach us there. So we are paying an enormous amount for services that could be funded in an, using another mechanism entirely. And someday someone will be brave enough to fix that. But good luck, because it, it's really hard. It's, it is operatic. There's drama, there's even humor in telecom policy, but you have to look, <laughs> you have to look hard. <laughs> Question in the back? Yeah. Um, well, I think you found the winning, uh, the winning uh, ticket for any candidate um, in the 2020 election. Uh, and, uh, but I was wondering about, um, did you say that, the, that this is manufactured in Corning or was designed in Corning? Corning actually invented low loss fiber. Um, it's a wonderful story. And I have no clients, no consulting relationships of any kind, just want to let you know. But Corning gave me a lot of information that helped me write this book. And one of the co-inventors of fiber, a guy named Pete Shuck, I think, has retired to the US Virgin Islands, read the book, and is wildly excited that somebody finally <laughs> captured his life story here. Uh, but they invented it in the uh, 70s. And it's been around for a while. And they, and they had a lot of patience. They waited until they found a market for it. Um, so Corning would probably do very well if uh, more of the country asked for more fiber. Because it is so difficult to manufacture, they will, they will make a lot of money. I don't know how to get around that. Um, maybe other competing manufacturers will emerge. It's, it's, I believe, no longer under patent. It couldn't be. It's been too long. Um, but it was fun visiting Corning. And for, for nothing else, I hope you read the chapter where I run down five flights of stairs to watch this little strand being drawn down from a big glob of glass to form fiber. It is magical. That story was also excerpted on Wired. Wired, Com. yeah. Wired did me the favor of excerpting that, so it's available publicly. You don't have but to. But you buy should the buy book. the book. <laughs> so, yes. Question back here. When, when do we stop? Uh, so yeah, you were yeah. you were mentioning about how a lot of the telco uh, lobbying arms, you know, definitely have their their hands in all the cookie jars. Yeah. Um, 
Can you talk about your perspective on the legality of communities to take on the work to build these networks? Because I've heard rumors that some communities, um, there's like laws barring those types oh, yeah. of things, et cetera. Um, and obviously that's probably community to community, but what was your perspective oh, on Oh, I that? appreciate the question. And Peter mentioned this, in 19 states, it's either difficult or impossible for municipalities to do this for themselves. Some of the states that passed that ALEC draft are now reversing it or considering reversing it because it's so clear that, in fact, this is a useful thing for cities to do and, and uh, turns out to work quite well. Um, there are states where it's possible, and California is one of them. So uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting activity in, in California. Uh, that, so it really matters what state you're in. In Colorado, a purple state, something like two-thirds of the counties have voted affirmatively to uh, allow municipalities to build or design or call for their own fiber networks. In Massachusetts, where I spend a lot of time, there's a whole law called the Municipal Light Plant Law that allows any, any municipality to do this. But if you're in Tennessee or North Carolina, it's, it's just about impossible because two very successful networks were launched, Chattanooga and then Wilson, North Carolina, that prompted the passing of draconian laws that make it impossible for anybody else to go through that door. So it matters where you live, and uh, there is an ongoing effort to roll back some of those state laws or to preempt them at the federal level. Senator John McCain, late great senator, really pushed this. This was one of his favorite issues. He said, we cannot afford to leave any option off the table that may affect our competitiveness as a country. He really got it. And you could just add one word to the federal statute that would preempt these state laws. But so far, it's been difficult to pass that statute. I think, I think that's it. With John McCain, I think we can't go any better than that, right? So. You'll be uh, signing books, I sure. understand, Sure, I'll sign books. I'm very grateful to you. I'm grateful to you for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure. Much thanks. To Susan Crawford and Peter Rubin. Please pick up information about the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Come up, buy a book, and have it signed. And join us for our ne next Tech and the City program on April 25th. Uh, what's happening with infrastructure here in San Francisco? Mm -hmm.